afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Introduction to Device Clinic Accreditation. My name is Kelly Baer and I'm the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left sidebar is the resources tab. Click on this tab for a link to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the request support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the ASRT CE credit, you must be registered logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The link to the survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. This presentation is intended to provide facilities with an understanding of the application process for device clinic accreditation. And with that said, I will now turn this webinar over to today's, today's speaker, Frank Vermeeren, IAC Director of Accreditation for Cardiac Electrophysiology. Frank? Thank you, Kelly, and welcome everybody to today's presentation. We're very excited about sharing this information on device clinic accreditation. And uh, before we get started, I wanted to uh, say that one, we're gonna be covering the standards and application process itself, and then we'll be followed by a question and answer uh, session. Uh, I also want to remind everybody of an upcoming CME um, opportunity. It's gonna be on cardiovascular catheterization accreditation on May the 26th at one o'clock p.m. So. If you haven't had an opportunity to register, please do so. Uh, we also have a, a kind of a fun gaming uh, app that we've uh, been very successfully uh, launching over the last uh, several months. Uh, it is available on our website at www.intersocietal.org, or you can go to any of our social media links on Twitter and Facebook and, and other social media. And it's, it's just, it has some fun, fun questions in each one of our uh, diagnostic and uh, procedural based accreditation programs, and they're just fun to do and uh, test your knowledge against other people. Uh, I do want to, of course, say thank you for everybody who's been uh, working in the COVID uh, during this era, era of COVID. Uh, we know that there's many stressors and you have uh, many challenges that you face on a daily basis. And because of this, we understand that volumes are down, that uh, staffing is, is sometimes low. And so, uh, because we normally would go, when you fill out an application, we ask that you go back 12 months. We understand that sometimes the volumes just aren't there. And so if you need to go back 18 months or even longer, uh, please just let us know and we'll I'll be happy to work with you to, uh, to uh, decide what, pro, what uh, cases to be reviewing. But again, any, any uh, uh, data that we ask for the prior 12 months, you can extend it out uh, to 18 months if you need to, to, to accommodate the volume requirements. Uh, our program, as, as you may be aware, if you look at the list of names on here, you'll see many uh, familiar names, and uh, maybe some of you are attending today, uh, but uh, you'll see that we have representation from several of our sponsoring organizations that are key to the uh, key influencers in cardiac electrophysiology and device management. Uh, we have the Alliance for Cardiovascular Professionals, um, Heart Rhythm Society, and of course, uh, uh, PACES with Pediatric and Congenital Echocardiography, Electrocardiography Societies. We also include cardiology members at large, and as well as nursing members at large. And we we um, have a very well balanced board, and where uh, where we need to have additional expertise in new emerging areas such as the device clinic, 
uh, we bring in outside, uh, we bring in uh, um, any of the, you know, the, the, the specialists in those areas and add them to our board of directors. And so that's why you'll see such a wide variety of, of the names and, um, and uh, specialties on our, listed on our board of directors. Uh, we have uh, currently five areas that we credit in our cardiac electrophysiology program. Uh, since the beginning, we've been doing uh, testing and ablation, device implantation, and chronic lead extraction, but re uh, recently added left atrial appendage occlusion by device. And uh, our latest addition is device clinic. And by uh, a device clinic, uh, what we mean is that we're looking at uh, facilities that do um, uh, on-site and remote monitoring. Uh, we, you can uh, add this as an add-on procedural area to an existing uh, EP accreditation, or you can have a standalone uh, application as well. So if you uh, have an administrative um, separation from your EP lab, or if it's, uh, you have a different uh, cost center that in your hospital where things are managed separately, feel free to uh, apply as a standalone accreditation where you can just do device clinic only accreditation, or if you prefer, you can add on to your, um, your EP accreditation in your lab. I did want to be very clear, and I'll be saying this several times during this presentation, is that we're not just looking at the device clinic in the hospital or in a, in a cardiac institution. We're looking at the full, um, uh, the full array of what you do in a device clinic, from not only on-site, uh, post-procedural on-site um, uh, evaluations of the patient, but also your remote monitoring of those implantable devices. Because you know, we know that because of COVID, we've done a lot more telemedicine and we found that the, the, there's been a huge shift in how we manage patients who've had devices. You know, many of them either prefer not to come in or if they have the opportunity, or uh, it may be just not convenient to have people come into the hospital at all times. So uh, the remote monitoring has become very important. And we, with that, we have some new challenges as far as managing that data that is being transmitted and also uh, taking that data and making sure that it's, uh, that it's uh, um, archived correctly and it's e easily retrievable and also available to referring physicians at the course of primary care physician and uh, for, for the patients as well when they need to have uh, information for follow-ups. So our accreditation process for the device clinic application is really a three-step process. Um, we have a facility assessment where we ask you to download the standards, look at our uh, accreditation checklist that's available on the, our website, and to see how, um, how prepared or how, how uh, while well, you're aligned with the standards and guidelines uh, uh, that the IC has uh, worked with our sponsoring organizations and our board of directors to develop. Uh, we ask that you complete an online application and we have a really nice new feature available to you for the application process, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And then uh, once you submit your application, uh, uh, there we do ask that you uh, give us a log and I'll talk about that again. Uh, and then we select cases randomly for you to provide documentation for us to review. Uh, now, within um, there really is a two-part pro process. One is that there's a one-year grant, and then there's a full grant. The full grant is just really this three-part process, meaning that you submitted your data, it's been successfully granted, uh, and we give you the three-year accreditation right off the bat. Uh, if there are some suggestions for improvement, we have uh, within that first year, we do a post-decision documentation review. And then we'll just review if there's just a, maybe a, one or two areas that, uh, or maybe it's your policies that need to be uh, developed, have a little further development, or maybe the meeting minutes and your quality improvement metrics um, don't include everything that we require. Uh, and the, from the standards, we'll just go ahead and just review that, uh, giving you some time to, um, to work that into your process. And then we'll look at that before the end of the first year. And then, of course, with a successful review of that documentation, we'll extend it for the full three years. So it's a really easy process. Um, we work with you throughout the entire um, application and post-grant process to make sure that you're very successful because that's our intent is to make sure everybody successfully uh, completes the application process. Uh, again, when we ask that you look at your facility to do a facility evaluation, we ask that you download the standards. It's available for free on the website. There's, you, know, you don't have to give us any information to get those. You just go on our website and you can download our standards and then review at your leisure. Certainly any of the helpful documentation is also available to you uh, to um, to review and it's again you don't have to give us any information just really uh, access it and download it uh, and then once you're ready to do your online application you'd want to create a new account if you don't already have an existing account if you have an existing account you can add that on add a device clinic application onto your accreditation or um, you can I'll, I'll, I'll look at that a little bit later uh, well uh, you can go ahead and use our quick application process which is really uh, 
that's been a, a great way to streamline the um, the application process for for people who've not done our either have currently have an IC accreditation in EP or um, aren't used for, aren't familiar with our application process. So it's just a quick link to get to it. Uh, the standards are made of um, standards and guidelines. Uh, the standards are things that you must do, and uh, the guidelines are things that are supportive uh, and that you should do. But again, the standards really uh, are, are minimum requirements to which you are being held accountable for, meaning that uh, the sponsoring organizations have created guidelines and our board of directors have taken those guidelines and looked at them and said, these are the things that are really important to make sure that every program uh, incorporates into uh, their processes. And so those become standards. There are still some that are guidelines that really support those standards that you must do. Uh, and it's just really supportive information in order to, uh, again, make sure that whatever you're implementing that's according to the standards is successful. And you'll see that there, uh, the guidelines are written in italicized, italicized lettering, and that really just helps you quickly identify which things are you uh, just should do that you aren't really necessarily need to incorporate right away, but you should plan on doing so. Uh, anything that's not a tile size is a standard, and those things you do you must do. Uh, the experience pathways for staffing uh, are fairly straightforward. Uh, for medical directors and medical staff, of course, they should be licensed and board certified in their specialty. Uh, we do have pathways that uh, uh, the, the physicians must uh, meet one or more of those specialties. One, of course, is that they're board certified uh, that they have or that and or they've uh, achieved their level through training in cardiac electrophysiology. Uh, they may also have gotten the cardiac device remote monitoring specialist um, uh, uh, board certification from IBRHE. And for the medical staff in general, not the medical director, medical directors must have more experience than six months, but uh, for medical staff, they must have at least six months of experience in reviewing transmissions, interrogations, and, and or vendor device transmission interrogation training. Uh, for the medical director and staff, uh, they must be able to demonstrate familiarity with the equipment associated with the post-procedural on-site and longitudinal remote monitoring of implantable devices, meaning anything that you use in device clinic or use to, um, to process uh, the remote um, interrogations and monitoring. They should be familiar with that equipment and um, be able to uh, be uh, familiar enough to, in order to uh, look at the data, transmit, you know, uh, receive the data, and then archive the data if necessary. And of course, if that's under the direction of uh, support staff, that's okay as well. So, um, because we don't expect that everybody is familiar with everything in every lab, <laughs> but uh, we certainly want to make sure that they're familiar with it. Um, all staff uh, must be uh, are held to having 15 category or uh, whether it's uh, CME that are specific to their specialty, meaning that if you're a nurse that you have your CEUs, if, you have, or if you're a tech that you may be category A, or it could be um, uh, some other type of CU, but physicians, we ask that they have 15 category one CME, and that there's relative to heart rhythm disorders. Uh, and again, this is over three years. So uh, the prior three years, uh, or the three years within the first, uh, including that first year, um, of accreditation, they should be able to have 15 CME that are, that are specific or relative to heart rhythm uh, disorders. Uh, for the device clinic managers, the type of people that we're looking to be a manager, of course, are RNs. Uh, any any variation of RN from uh, from nurse practitioners to visit to a doctorate, um, certainly PAs, and also uh, electric uh, cardiac specific elect, uh, um, exercise physiologists. Again, they must have 15 CME uh, relative to heart rhythm disorders as well. In adult practices, they must be BLS and ACLS. In pediatrics, they must be BLS and PALS. Uh, and of course, just like every other staff member, that's certainly specific, or, um, uh, they should be able to demonstrate familiarity with all the equipment as well that's used in your clinic and for remote monitoring. Uh, we do emphasize the uh, importance of advanced uh, additional credentialing that has that's specific to rhythm management. Uh, through the CCI, that would be the Certified Cardiographic Technician, the CCT, and the Certified Rhythm Analysis Technician, the CRAT. And uh, IBRIT, there are two that are specific to rhythm management. One is the Certified Cardiac Device Specialist, the CCDS. And uh, now that we have a remote monitoring um, uh, requirement, uh, we certainly uh, encourage everyone to get the Cardiac Device Remote Monitoring Specialist, uh, the CDRMS. This is very important. Uh, it shall look at the requirements to take the CRDMS, you'll see that they, they really closely aligned with our standards or our standards are aligned very closely with requirements, but it's, it, the, um, 
requirements are very good about um, organizing what is really required in order to be successful at doing, having a remote monitoring program. Uh, the IBRG did an excellent job of that, and uh, uh, that's why we felt it was important to, to highlight the fact that this is really an important credential to obtain. It's a brand new credential, and I know there's a lot of interest in it, so uh, if you need um, uh, resources to get to, uh, to find where to apply for this or to get information on it, please feel free to contact us or go to the IBRHE website. Uh, for device clinic staff, it's really meant to the same type of people that would be, uh, that's maybe not the manager, but the, the support staff should also be uh, RNs and, and PAs and nurse practitioners, as well as um, exercise physiologists. They have the same requirements um, that the manager has. Uh, and also we encourage that advanced uh, additional device credentialing. There are a few other types of patient or um, staff members that we encourage or we, we recognize. Uh, those are, um, in addition to the, the CDRMS monitoring specialist, that allied professionals uh, that are maybe their EMTs or their uh, OR techs or um, other types of specialty procedure techs that have been cross-trained for uh, device clinic. Uh, they must have a, either a minimum of associate's degree in, in health specialty uh, with a minimum of one year's um, CID remote monitoring or in-person evaluations. And if they don't have an associate specific in healthcare, uh, <clears throat> they have a minimum of two years of that type of training. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and we also have six months of device management and cardiac rhythm analysis and remote monitoring that's recommended for everybody. Um, for the, one of the new uh, staff requirements we have uh, especially in the device clinic, that's really specific to device clinic, is the IT information officer uh, or represent, representative of the IT department that is um, that you recognize as someone who is your go-to person for your device clinic. Maybe a team or maybe an individual that uh, is really uh, responsible for helping you manage your um, equipment and managing your data uh, storage and archival. Uh, but uh, really they're responsible for doing that and uh, performing the initial and annual surveys of all of your equipment um, and uh, your processes uh, that they provide you with a written summary of all the assessments and evaluation criteria for that that they did, as well as uh, performing, uh, providing guidance for any of the patient data management issues that occurred or uh, arise throughout, throughout the year. Um, they, um, of course, they're, they're also required to, to um, make sure that you are informed or that you have the ability to keep your um, PHI secure uh, that uh, for the staff and for the, the patients. Uh, and it's recommended the information specialists observe what you do for a living in the device clinic uh, because it's important for them to really be familiar with the importance of, of why things need to occur in a certain way and that you are out that you need to make sure that all the data is able to be um, processed in a timely fashion. You don't want to have lots of data that has to be downloaded at a later date because there's issues with you know, the ongoing issues with the, the um, your IT system. So uh, it's important for them to at least have a, a routine of, um, the ability to uh, uh, routinely observe and uh, make sure that they have a good understanding of what you do in your lab. Uh, now your facilities, uh, what you require of your facilities is that you have the adequate space to ensure the patient's safety and confidentiality during your interrogations. Uh, and of course, uh, remote uh, monitoring, of course, your system should be, have the ability to be secure as well, not to be, um, you know, hacked as we, we, uh, we're all familiar with us with um, the internet and uh, how easy it is to do that type of thing. Um, that you certainly must have adequate space to ensure the staff safety. You don't want to have a cluttered room where just once a patient sleep left that you have a difficult man time managing within the room trying to get things uh, processed and to be able to uh, have your daily activities within that room. Um, certainly want to have access to medical emergency equipment and medications as well as uh, adequate interrogation and data management equipment at your disposal in order to be successful in, and uh, taking care of that patient. By emergency uh, equipment and medications, uh, it's you know, the, the general type of things that we require to have access to, and that's immediate access. Doesn't mean within the room that you're working, but it's maybe in the hallway, but certainly it's a, you know, the, that you have a, available to in case you need it. But of course, it's basic things like oxygen suction, uh, the defibrillator, um, that everybody has, uh, that you have your ACLS and PELS medications available, depending on what type of patient um, population you take care of. Uh, of course, you need to have the res um, resuscitation bags and masks, a non rebreather mask, and then of course, other facility required equipment and supplies that are deemed um, required in your emergency uh, uh, carts uh, by your hospital. 
As far as the interrogation data, it's really anything that you need to have to facilitate that interrogation, interpretation, and reporting of the devices that you're managing. Uh, as far as when we ask for um, when we ask for case documentation uh, or the case the documentation that you need to have for every patient, uh, we're going to be looking for the initial documentation. That's really uh, what you have before and when you immediately when you receive the patient for the first time. That they, that you have, um, of course, the adequate supply of that manufacturer, uh, the manufacturer provided uh, interrogation equipment. That there's a history and physical, or at least a consult available to you that has all of the history and physical type of um, documentation uh, prior to you actually having the patient come in the room. So that way, when you're looking at the patient, you have a, a good um, understanding of what they're there for and what they've had and how the, and, and the, the immediate needs for those patients they come in to see you. Of course, you need to have the ability to do proper patient identification, uh, that you have a written patient consent uh, or a contract, depending on how, uh, what, how you prefer to, to organize that, but it's really a permission for the patient to be followed in a device clinic, meaning that they have an agreement that they're going to be coming in to see you, and if not, um, what they would, where they would go and what they would need to do to um, be followed up. So it could be a one-time post-operative check if you're a regional referral center and they may go back to somebody else but that you have the consent saying, okay, you're here to have you know, your, your follow-up, but um, we agree to make sure that all your, your data goes to where whoever the doctor is that you need to be followed up by, and that you will see them once you get there. Um, the pre-monitoring evaluation rhythm, meaning that uh, you would have the baseline rhythm um, documented. If you um, have, are you reprogramming during the, the interrogation sometime during, or during the evaluation? That you also document the new rhythm that uh, or the rhythm that's left after you've, you've reprogrammed, uh, and when of course if applicable, if you've had to order laboratory testing, uh, that uh, or that you need laboratory testing uh, as part of the uh, protocol, that is properly ordered and then it's also uh, the data is archived uh, appropriately, and of course you want to document any presence of any abandoned device or lead hardware. So if they've had um, if they've had a device change. Uh, and leads change, but they had to leave some leads in place. You need to have documented which, what is left in place, demanded, and of course, everything that's new that they've been, that they put in. Uh, on-site documentation, you know, what you've done when you're actually in the clinic. And seeing them, of course, you want to be able to uh, document the device site appearance and location. Uh, and that includes a device site photo, uh, if that's indicated uh, when they come in for their rechecks. But uh, there should be an additional device site photo that's in your record to show what the status of that site was when they first saw you. So that way, if an infection occurs later or there's some increased reddening or a change of the site, uh, we're able to document, this is what it looked like when we saw them last. And then now please provide another uh, image to, uh, to, uh, to archive, but also um, if you'd be able to identify whether or not there's a significant enough change to have them come in urgently into the hospital and be followed up. Because um, of course, that's one of the most important things we do in device clinic is to monitor patients to make sure that if they um, have a potential to be in, uh, have a new infection or uh, an infection process is underway, that they're immediately taken care of and appropriately taken care of. Uh, so that way uh, they have a great success for recovering from that. Uh, any sort of um, information regarding that, that, uh, that implantable device, that means make model serial number, that you have that in there, uh, that uh, the type of enrollment that you're doing, whether it's a post-operative, um, immediate post-operative uh, uh, or evaluation or if it's a follow-up or what type of a, um, what type of protocol you're using um, and of course uh, what type of uh, what what they're there for is it something that's scheduled is it a, an unscheduled visit uh, is it just are they just there for interrogation only uh, uh, we want of course want to document that that the presenting rhythm uh, summary of the testing you do what the arrhythmia findings are during your evaluation uh, if they have heart failure data, or if you have reason to look at heart failure data, that you've documented that. And of course, you want to document what the uh, uh, projected battery longevity or the battery voltage is. If, if you aren't looking at longevity, um, if you have can document the battery voltage, that's helpful. Uh, what your plan of care is for that patient. And of course, the triage applic um, applicable evaluation findings. So, uh, uh, and of course, you want to document that you've stored it into, the, into your EMR. Uh, for the remote monitoring part of the documentation, and this is in addition to all the on-site documentation that you would be able to do um, uh, as, as well, uh, but this is things that you need to do uh, because uh, when you're transmitting data, there's specific information that you need to document in order to, um, 
show that you properly uh, evaluate somebody remotely through telemedicine. Uh, you want to, of course, document all the staff that's using that, um, that's facilitating that remote uh, uh, that remote interaction with them. But on the side, you're going to want to make sure that you have uh, all the documented all the people that are, have the ability to perform remote monitoring. And, um, and IT, of course, needs to have all of the appropriate documentation of their usernames and passwords and things like that. Um, of course, the uh, process in which each of the, the devices um, uh, are evaluated, uh, on, uh, and of course, the manufacturer's website data, that means that, that's been, uh, so the process that you've reviewed it, that you've entered in the device clinic database, uh, that you um, dismissed or archived within the manufacturer's website. So if you, anything that you, that you, you can have a document that you've reviewed it, that you have entered the device into the database, and if you've had to dismiss or, um, or uh, whether you've dismissed or archived within that manufacturer's website, that that's, that information is stayed in the manufacturer's website, or, and either and or also been duplicated into your database, or that it only is going to reside in that uh, manufacturer's website. And of course, uh, the device site photographs that a, that a patient takes remotely, that they're transmitted and archived um, appropriately, so you have access to that. And now, in addition to those, uh, like the initial documentation, we want to make sure that you've established a process for the management of all the manufacturer and and or FDA advisories and recalls. So uh, that's, of course, another one of the important things that happens in device clinic is that if you have a recall, you have to be able to um, go back and find the patient set that would affect. And that's one of the reasons why we ask that you document the, the um, abandoned and uh, uh, active uh, hardware that's in the patient of what they make model and serial number of each of the, the leads and the devices that you put in. Um, <clears throat> for the on-site documentation, uh, the, uh, the, that the data information must be entered into a secure database, electronic medical record. Again, that's all related to be able to do any sort of recall and or um, be able to follow that uh, manufacturer specific um, uh, issue with a device. Um, but of course, the, we want to make sure that we know what the patient has in, in them. Uh, you want a documentation of that, uh, the period procedure of device management, uh, such as uh, if you if you have a prop program where uh, you're from the device clinic, there must be a representative from the device clinic that goes when they, goes in with the patient to make sure that they uh, manage the device, um, turning it on and off and things, or uh, or CT or MRI or uh, spinal radio frequency ablations, uh, of course stress echocardiography, and those type of things where it's important to have either the patient at Without um, where you've turned off that that uh, uh, the um, the device temporarily while they're having their baseline imaging done, uh, or it has to be managed in some way to make sure that it's when they're finished with the exam that everything is functioning properly, that you have the appropriate staff uh, on hand and when those to assist those patients during those procedures. And if the um, and if it's an appropriate or if it's a, a prob, uh, potential to, where you need to have someone who has ACLS or PALS uh, uh, type of experience that they're available to help manage those patients. Uh, the final documentation uh, that must include a summary or conclusion of the results of that procedure, including any positive negative findings or adverse outcomes. And this is the physician's report or your final report that the physician overreads, um, that there you have a process of notifying the patient and the referring physician of the results. Um, uh, but you also must do that in a timely fashion. And uh, that means that your interpretation, initial interpretation, uh, is done within 24 hours for an inpatient, uh, which is generally not something you would do, but uh, and for an outpatient, it's within one business day. And for uh, then the finalization of that report needs to occur within an additional uh, 48 hours for an inpatient. And then, of course, for the outpatient, which is what you're most coming to do, is you have an additional two business days. Uh, to get to get that uh, report finalized and uploaded to your EMR, um, and of course you want to be able to document the frequency of the follow-up, when they need to come back, how often they're going to be coming back, and then of course if there is a reason why they um, are discontinuing the follow-up, maybe it was just again one time visit with you, and then they go to their home state to be followed by their local cardiologist, or maybe they've decided. Uh, well, there's a lot of reasons. It could be they go into hospice. It could be that they're going. Um, to uh, be transferred to another practice, or they just are not willing to come back. They just uh, they, they're going to come back when they feel they do, or they're going to find someone else or another program to be followed up. Hopefully, that um, you haven't been asked to uh, take care, uh, see a patient that you're never going to have an opportunity to make sure that they're followed up appropriately. 
because that's of course an important part of what we do in the device clinic is making sure patients are followed up with to here. Okay, so for the quality improvement portion of the application, uh, and again, this all relates, uh, you know, once you've done all this documentation, you certainly wanna be able to do some chart reviews to make sure that you have some continuity between from, uh, uh, from staff member to staff member, from uh, the, the uh, patient to patient, that uh, you wanna make sure that everybody always has the same level of um, quality from what in their reporting and their management and uh, interrogation of their devices. And so we looked at four different areas for device clinic uh, and for remote monitoring. We look at the data management uh, that we have so that you do chart reviews to make sure that everything is archived correctly and such, uh, that was safety and procedural outcomes, the interpretive quality review of that reporting and, and documents, and of course, the report completeness and timeliness. timeliness. Uh, for data management, we're gonna ask again that you look at data transmission and storage, that that's happening in a timely fashion that you're, you're not having uh, continual glitches with your software, that, um, that uh, everything is getting uploaded to the EMR and you're always able to find the data and, and retrieve the data in a, uh, appropriately, uh, that the reporting that you do is, is, is complete, meaning that your clinical reporting components are always included in every interrogation for every um, visit, whether it's remote or um, and face to face, that you have all of the device interrogation information uh, available to you that's appropriate for that device, and then of course data documentation uh, that is required. All the data documentation that you need to have uh, for uh, that the interaction is is also archived. Um, you want, of course, it's document the fact that you're um, that you're compliant and you're you're aligned with all of your remote monitoring protocols. Uh, it's a really important um, to have a protocol in place for what you do in a face-to-face -face interrogation or a face-to-face device clinic visit, as well as what you uh, require to do for remote monitoring. Uh, so because it's, if you have new employees, uh, and, and I think we're all facing that right now because of COVID that we have a fairly high turnover of employees, but when you have somebody come in new, that they have something that they can follow to give them a fighting chance in order to make sure that they're maintaining the same quality that the patient has always had coming into your clinic. For uh, the safety and procedural outcomes, we look at uh, we ask that you look at your um, your uh, documentation to make sure that the procedures that you perform that uh, that the, the outcomes are, are, are safe, and that if you have any outliers as far as incidents and things, that you uh, can discuss those in, in, uh, and and uh, learn from that uh, because it may be that they have they that there's an issue that occurs that. Uh, that um, courses are not avoidable, but yet um, all of the protocols and the safety pr um, uh, procedures that you have in place uh, work really well and the patient comes out with six successful outcomes. So those things are important to discuss, saying that what you're doing is working or if there's something where there's an opportunity to learn uh, from that incident, then that's something you wanna discuss. Um, that you document all the complications and the outcomes that occur within your, your, um, your facility for in the device clinic and remote monitoring. And again, this is an aggregate. This is not like saying, you know, you don't have to link an employee to a to a, a patient or anything like that. It's really saying of the patients, that, the 55 patients we took care of uh, in this this uh, evaluated period, uh, this is how many complications we occur, uh, had and this, this was uh, what the outcomes were. Uh, that of course, that you routinely properly uh, identify the patient, that there's, uh, you're gonna document medication safety, infection control, again, that's everything from the photos to any labs that you've had to, to um, run or in this uh, general um, interaction with the patient that would help reduce the infection uh, rate um, post-operatively. And the radiation safety, the reason we put radiation safety in here is because we know that sometimes device clinic personnel are asked to go into procedures where ionizing radiation is being produced, such as T, um, CT or in a, fluor a lab that's using, utilizing fluoroscopy. And so uh, we want to make sure that if you have an issue with a patient uh, exposure or a staff exposure, that, uh, that that's documented and, uh, and that it's appropriately handled. For the interpretive quality review, that's really just looking at doing a peer review. Someone, uh, uh, you uh, can anonymize the patient's data, and then you can uh, hand them to other, uh, from physician to physician, different physicians, so they can review each other's documentation, as well as the nursing staff or the uh, device clinic staff to to basically give a really nice objective overview of a document, make sure that say, well, you know, if you're very really close to that, that patient documentation, because it's documentation you did, uh, it may be that you need to have a fresh pair of eyes to look at and say, oh, 
this needs to be uh, further clarified or uh, you gave, did a great job of you gave us lots of data here or there was just one element that was missing and discuss why that happened. Uh, as far as report completeness and timeliness, that's really just saying that you have all the data that you uh, meant to acquire, that it's all available to you, that uh, none of it's missing, as well as that the, when we talk about timeliness of the interpretation and the, uh, the uh, release of the final report to your EMR, and of course, the proper notification and the timely notification to the patient and the referring physician or the cardiologist has ordered the, the, um, the device clinic visit. Uh, we have um, a minimum requirement that you have a quality improvement meeting where you discuss these metrics uh, once every six months. And uh, we uh, ask that you look at a minimum number of cases, and that's four cases per uh, area that you're credited in. In this case, it would be four cases for the device clinic. Um, and that's just, and again, that's only every six months. We know that you look at many more chart reviews than that uh, to on a routine basis. Uh, but this is really just to get your program started that you, um, that in that meeting that you have. Uh, that all significant complications um, are discussed, and then all rel relevant personnel must attend. And that means the, the, the medical staff that interpret uh, the, the, the final interpretations, as well as the, all of the, um, the nursing and uh, technical staff that are involved in the, uh, either the, the on-site face-to-face device uh, uh, clinic processes or the remote monitoring component as well. So that everybody must attend uh, at least one of those meetings face to face, and if they're not able to attend, they must review the um, meeting minutes and sign off that they they uh, understand and they own that information that was discussed. And it must be a signed document that you uh, have on record. And of course, the meeting minutes must be maintained for review because we're going to ask for a copy of your most recent meeting minutes uh, when you apply for the uh, accreditation. And also, if we do a uh, either um, a planned uh, visit within that first year or um, a um, random, I want to say an audit, but a random visit or uh, documentation review, uh, it will, will ask you for a copy of your most recent meeting minutes. And of course, when you have these meetings, it's really meant, uh, it's, it's really to allow you to uh, discuss, to, um, uh, to identify areas that you're doing really well, any, any sort of areas that you may need some improvement in, or you just need, you may need assistance. And of course, the IC is here to help you with that if you find there's something that uh, you, you may want to work a little bit more on, or you need some suggestions on what type of metrics you can use to, to help evaluate that, please let us know. We're here to help you. Uh, and of course, we want you to be able to benchmark from, uh, from meeting to meeting, uh, quarter to quarter or, or year to year to show your progress as far as um, improvement um, in, in your program. Uh, we do offer uh, both written <laughs> like, uh, paper versions as well as an online a QI self-assessment tool. Uh, what's really nice about this is our tool is designed to have questions that will satisfy each of those four metrics that we ask you to look at, your data management, your, um, your report completeness and timeliness, uh, those, those four metrics. And uh, it allows you to basically um, uh, assign cases to staff members to review. And what it does is that you will um, somewhat anonymize the the uh, document uh, the the patient's information. Uh, it will uh, and then you assign more than one or more staff members to review that documentation. And once you assign it, it'll automatically send an email to that staff member to say that they have a chart for the, the a chart review that they need to do. And what happens is that when they click on the link, it opens up a questionnaire that will ask enough questions to satisfy those four metrics. And then at the end. Um, when they've, when everybody has finished all of their their reviews, it will print out a beautiful report that allows you to see um, to see some uh, important metrics that uh, allow you to do that outcome um, management and out, and uh, trending within your department. It's very easy to do. You just uh, when you um, open up an account, and again, this doesn't cost you anything. You can do this for free. Uh, it has a uh, you know once you open establish that account there's a tab series of tabs at the top there's a quality improvement tab at the top you click on it and it allows you to um, start managing that those cases and you'll see here there's it says cardiac electrophysiology uh, but you would select device clinic uh, as far and then the question appropriate questionnaires would be assigned uh, there's also a nice tutorial that's available to help you navigate that or you can call me or one of the staff here at IC and we're happy to help you get that program started and navigate the website. 
Uh, and again, here's an example of the online questionnaire. So this looks, there's a paper version of this, but uh, this is, this, they duplicate exactly on uh, the electronic version. And so, and this one is a safety and procedural outcomes uh, section, and it's very, very basic questions. Uh, you're looking at your documentation on one screen, and here you have this questionnaire on the other. It says, what's pr proper identification of the patient evaluation and monitoring carried out uh, prior to the monitoring evaluation? So but prior to actually starting, did you properly identify the patient? Yes or no? Uh, was the history and physical examination performed prior to your initial device clinic visit? Was the pre-monitoring or evalu evaluation rhythm documented? Uh, did the physician procedure report contain one or more internal inconsistencies, meaning that what was there, what it would say they did one thing in one part of it, and then all of a sudden they contradicted themselves in, in the report a little bit later. Um, it could be just a measurement issue of saying the rhythm was one thing when it they, they used a different term or they um, it wasn't the exact term they should be using. Uh, uh, that uh, So there's inconsistency within that report. Um, was the president of a banded device and need hardware documented? So if, if they had it, uh, did they... Did they make mention of it, and was it documented the, uh, that it was there? Now, if it's done by some other facility, you don't know what the lead or the device was that was in there. Um, you just the fact that you identified and said it was present, and you know maybe it's a, a partial lead that was left in. You just want to make a doc. That, um, if it wasn't yours, that you don't know what it was, uh, then you just make mention of that it was there and it was left. You know, it was, it was left where it was left. Uh, and then, of course, was a written patient consent to be filed in device clinic obtained and documented. So you just answer yes or no, we're not applicable. And then other people will also review the same document. And then it comes out with a nice, uh, uh, again, measurement at the end. But uh, when you get the final report, you'll see that this is a, an example of test appropriateness, which is not one of the requirements for, um, for uh, device clinic, but it's the same type of, uh, it's really just to demonstrate what it looks like. So that questionnaire, each, next to each one of those questions, depending on how many people reviewed, it'll have either green checks or uh, a red check. And so, and if you look on the left side, uh, where it says um, appropriate, usually appropriate, maybe appropriate or rarely uh, appropriate, usually not appropriate, you'll see there are two green checks and one red check. So if um, the question should have been answered, yes, uh, it, it'll be green check. If it was something that should not have been answered as no, but it was answered no, then it would have a red check. And it shares, it shows how many people answered those uh, questions the way they did. Uh, nobody answered it inappropriately, but they had comments saying, uh, why, you know, you have two people that are saying was appropriate or usually appropriate. One said it may be appropriate. They questioned it. And so in the comments, it said appropriate indication for performance of the procedure. Pretty straightforward, but somebody said it was an incomplete indication as compared to the patient's history and physical documentation. So what they were ordered and what came into the, uh, and what was um, on the final report did not match. But you'll see that overall on the on the far right corner is a green check, and it says that that uh, that it uh, that in general everybody answered yes. But more importantly, what that means is that the answers aligned with the standards. And you'll see next to that question here it says, "Was the clinical information provided was the test ordered an appropriate indication?" And it tells you which what part of the standards it is and what standard it was that were specifically that you specifically met. So it means that your answer is aligned with our standards, and that's really an important thing to be able to understand because if you have everybody answering and it's all a bunch of red checks, you can say, oh, the standards and guidelines that your that HRS and PACES and others have come up with, um, uh, we're not meeting that guideline. And this is what those guidelines really are. They're, they're directly come from those sponsoring organizations and, and documents that have been, uh, have been put out to say, this is how your lab should be running. So again, uh, when you have one or more person answering these, you'll see uh, that you are provided uh, some really important uh, data output. So one is the overall case quality and one is overall staff agreement. The overall case quality is what we talked about before. How closely did your responses align with our standards and guidelines? And so the fact that, it, it, again, this is a, shows in these four areas and this uh, that there's some areas that they did very well in and their quality score, there's some couple had 100%, one had 80%, one had 60%. You're going to want to look at um, in court report completeness and timeliness. It could be either that they missed a couple components, or it could be that they're routinely not um, meeting the, uh, the. Maybe it's either the interpretation timeline, or it could be the um, the final report upload and finalization of the report. So it just means that you're not aligned with the standards, or you're you are aligned with the standards, whichever the, the finding is here. The overall staff agreement is exactly what that means. Of the responses you had. How, um, 
how well is everybody following the same rules when they're evaluating the data? I mean, are they all same, coming up with the same answer or are they all not coming up with the same answer? And so you could, it's gonna give you an opportunity to take a those, look at those questions that are in the full report and say, where were people missing this? Where were people, or, or you know, maybe you had a question about people were um, answering things the way they're supposed to be. And say, oh, great, they did a great job. Everybody answered it the same way. But if there was a concern of a certain area where you've seen some trouble in the past, you can actually focus on that area and say, see, we have an issue here. Uh, there are some people that um, maybe are misunderstanding what the, 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 the reasons why we, we track something or why we, why we report certain data. And um, we wanna make sure everybody's very clear on this. So you do a nice review of that section. And all of this is anonymous. Nobody knows who fil- completed these reports. There's no names that transfer, no names do not transfer with their uh, results. Um, and uh, there's no really way to go back and try to dig out those uh, individuals who uh, answered, the, gave the responses they gave. So it's a really nice way to, to, um, uh, to expose successes and, uh, and, and challenges within your department. And again, we have paper versions of all those questions for each one of the, the areas that we accredit in um, cardiac electrophysiology. And of course, with the, the QI tool, we have some, that electronic version, we have some nice things that we can do. One is that the physicians can obtain a maintenance of certification activity points. And of course, for the staff, it's not as important for you to know this, but for the physicians, it's something that's really important. They, they, they are required to um, have a certain number of MOC activity points uh, every year or every three years uh, to satisfy their, their um, APIM and American, Bo- American Board of Internal Medicine, American Board of Pediatrics uh, certifications. And they have four categories in general they have to complete. And so this gives a very nice, this gives a significant number of points to those areas and uh, they're able to use that tool to uh, do maintenance of certification activities. And it's something that's designed specifically for physicians who are um, in an accredited facility. So it is not available to everybody for free, um, meaning that you just, uh, a physician just can't sign up for it. Uh, but if they're in an accredited facility, they have a free access to this program. Uh, as far as MIPS and MACRA, I know many people are familiar now with the new CMS requirement to um, to do uh, additional um, metrics or measures, and they have to do them throughout the year and then report at the end of the year their findings of their metri- measures they do and how they've implemented the changes. And so you can use this same tool to satisfy a portion of the MIPS um, requirement for uh, through MACRA. And the hospitals are, are, are very familiar with the fact that they need to satisfy these measures. So they'll be very interested in knowing how to do this. And really, it's very simple. You just evaluate 10 patients uh, every month for uh, three consecutive months or a minimum of 90 days. And, um, and then you look at the findings from that and then you uh, basically have a meeting where you, you show how you've put the, you've, uh, what your findings were and how you uh, use those findings to improve your practice is really what it is. And so hospitals, are, it's important for hospitals, it's also important for physician practices. So uh, if you have a, a, um, a remote, uh, um, remote monitoring service, it's important for you, for your physicians, uh, in order to, for Medicare reimbursement. And for hospitals, it's helpful for the hospital to have this access to these measures as well. Uh, and again, for the application process, we talked about a really nice new tool to be able to streamline your process. One is that you can formally go in and open up an application and st- or add, and add it to your or add it to your um, add a device clinic to your existing application. But we also have a nice link on our uh, website. So if you go to the intersocietal.org uh, and then select cardiac electrophysiology, you'll see that there's a page that you go to that says "Getting Started." And over in the left hand uh, right hand column, you'll see it says "Apply for Device Clinic." Just click on that link, and it pops up a quick form. So that allows you to get started very quickly. It's very easy to do. And once you fill this out, uh, we um, work with you to, to fill out the appropriate um, information as well as uh, to submit the appropriate cases and, and complete your application. So it's a really nice, quick uh, access to start your application. Again, all this is free. We don't ask for any money until um, it's time to, uh, to uh, submit your application or certainly before you, you get your decision. But again, it's a, it's a very nice streamlined process that we've developed, and I'm, I'm sure you all will appreciate that and, uh, uh, as you get started here. So who do you need to include on your application? It's really anybody who's actively involved in your device clinic or your remote uh, monitoring program. And that's your medical staff, your nurses, your specialists, your technologists, any advanced practice providers. And of course, your, um, the 
uh, advanced practice providers, also include your uh, exercise physiologists that, are, that do specifically do uh, cardiac um, procedures. Uh, as far as the case submission, we ask that you, uh, there's three things that we ask that you give us. One is a patient log, and it's really, you can anonymize that, but as long as you can, uh, when we identify the patient that, through the mechanism that you use to identify the patient, that you're able to find that documentation and supply it to us. We ask for the most recent 30 consecutive cases, and it's basic information. It's the, uh, whatever you're using to identify the patient, uh, the date of the procedure, the indication for that procedure. We know what that's going to be, but how is it? And then... Uh, uh, what type you did, whether it was a device clinic visit or remote monitoring, uh, who the physician was that um, who, who uh, oversaw that as well. And if you have any complication, it could be just put yes or no. You don't have to tell us what the complication was. Um, and then what do you need to, uh, what do you type of things we're going to ask for you for every patient when we look, when we do a random selection of cases from that list of 30, we're going to pick uh, four cases. And of those four cases, we're going to ask for these uh, this information, this is all available on our website. Certainly you can download the presentation of the data so you have access to it. But it's that history and physical or that um, consultation report that, uh, that, you had, that you need to have before you actually uh, sign up your patients. Uh, and of course, that consent or contract form that you use, uh, that you use with the patient to be followed in the device clinic. Your uh, pre-monitoring or evaluative rhythm. And of course, and if, you've, if, if you've modified that rhythm during the course of that visit, that you've supplied that rhythm. And we're talking about the actual rhythm. It's like a rhythm strip, whatever, you know, 12 lead, whatever you're using. It's not just a, uh, a documentation of what the rhythm was. I mean, it's not, not a, just a written description. It's the actual rhythm itself. So, you, uh, so we can compare that rhythm with what you've documented. Um, and of course, if, you've, if it's an applicable that if you've done ordered labs or if it's part of your protocol that you've uh, provided that as well, um, the device interrogation report, any device site photos that were required for that visit, uh, and then the final report, and that's the report that's either your report that's um, signed off by the physician or it's a separate physician's report uh, for that clinic visit or remote monitoring. And then the three things we ask for the applications, one, your quality improvement policy. We have a sample document that tells outlines what needs to be in your QI policy that's available on our website. Uh, the most recent quality improvement meeting minutes. And of course, when you go to submit, we don't expect that you have every process in place every metric in place, but um, we ask that you just, uh, because this is meant to be a quality improvement process, this application process, so just submit us what you did in your last meeting minutes, and then we'll give you a suggestion for improvement. If you have all the metrics in there and they're all properly discussed, that's great. If you're missing one or two, that's okay too. Uh, that's why we're here. We're here to give you suggestions and to help, uh, uh, and help you uh, evaluate your program. And of course, that case log with the 30 most recent patients. So. Um, it's very simple as far as what you need to apply is just have those three documents. And then we um, select those cases and then uh, you'll receive an email saying which cases we selected, it'll all be secured. You can upload to your uh, the secure portal. So it's all, again, uh, everything is, um, is HIPAA and high tech compliant on our websites. And so you don't have any problem, you don't have any to worry about any sort of disclosure of, 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 of PHI. So uh, with this, I want to, uh, Remind everybody that uh, please call us if you have any questions. We're here to help. Uh, this is meant to be a high-level overview of what our device clinic uh, accreditation program is. Uh, you certainly can contact me directly or Heidi Barnard. She's an excellent um, uh, application specialist. She's our clinical specialist for all of the interventional areas. Uh, she has a um, she has a big job, but she's very knowledgeable and is, is, is always available to help. So I'm going to turn this back over to um, Heidi and Kelly for our question and answer session. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thanks, Frank. And at this time, we will begin the Q&A session. From IAC, I'd like to introduce Heidi Barnard, Interventional Clinical Specialist, and she will assist Frank with the Q&A session today. Heidi, would you like to start us off? Yes, thank you, Kelly. And thank you, Frank, for the excellent uh, presentation. We do have some questions. The first one here is regarding uh, staff requirements. And the question, Frank, is, CCDS certification for allied professionals through IBHRE acceptable in lieu of CDRMS? Well, well absolutely. Uh, the, those are um, credentials of CCDS and the CDRMS are highly encouraged. They're not necessarily required. If you have them, we're really hoping that you do. But if, if you, uh, you don't, but you meet one of the other um, experience pathways, 
uh, that's our minimum requirement. But we encourage to have the CCDS. Of course, everybody who has a CCDS knows how um, how um, uh, how high level that is. Meaning that it's a really it's a difficult exam. You, uh, you really have to know your stuff as far as uh, how to interrogate devices and to follow up and manage and, uh, the, the device rhythms and be able to identify rhythms and, and the medications that go along with it. So it's a really, um, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very extensive uh, um, uh, test and it's a very uh, well-recognized credential and it's, it's one that's really important to the field. And so uh, either one of those uh, certainly is, is something that we, um, except uh, the CODMS, if you're doing remote monitoring, that's really designed for that type of um, of uh, process. And so that's either one is going to be acceptable, but we certainly acknowledge both of those. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, can you please talk in more detail about the patient consent to be followed in device clinic? What is the rationale and how should this be considered in pediatrics? Okay, so this uh, that would be uh, for, for pediatrics. Of course, it would be just like you have other consents where the the um, the, the parents and or guardians are the ones who would be um, signing that document. But uh, the consent form itself, the reason why we ask for it is because the to to if you are going to be routinely following somebody, uh, you want to make sure that they understand that they have a responsibility as well to be followed in the clinic, to be um, available to you, uh, to schedule. Uh, interactions to be able to do the interrogations that they understand that there is going to be and it may be a 30 to um, minute interrogation remotely but it, or, or longer uh, that they if they are local they can come to the, the hospital if it's if you aren't under COVID restrictions um, but uh, it's really meant to be an agreement saying we're here to help you and do all these monitorings but in, on your part also you need to be available to us and make sure that you routinely follow up because the last thing you want to do is lose somebody to follow up and have them show up with an infection or um, that they need to have something significant done with to um, adjust their the parameters on their device. So it's really meant to be an agreement uh, to say both parties understand what the relationship is in a, for device clinic uh, and remote monitoring follow-ups. Uh, and again, if it's something where uh, it's not required because really it's just meant to be um, a post-discharge uh, uh, visit to make sure that they have, you have the appropriate documentation in place uh, to send to the referring physician wherever they're going to be followed up. But also that agreement would be nice if they had something that would say, we agree to be followed up at another hospital because then that's something that the hospital needs to make sure that, you know, again, that's a part of the responsibility of the device clinic is to make sure that people are going somewhere to be followed up and being, being taken care of if they can't be followed up at their own device clinic. Great well, thank question. you. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, next question is, what is the time frame in which the H&P needs to have been performed? So most hospitals have a time requirement of how long an h &P is um, good for, but again, it's probably something that needs to happen. That's why we say that if you do a consultation form or um, a consultation form, because if it's somebody, if it's, it needs to be done between the time it was, the device was implanted and you see them. Uh, so that may be a short period of time, but it may be a longer period of time. So it's really within the requirements of what the hospital states uh, says, because it could be that it's a 30 day, some hospitals have longer than that, but in general, it's usually a 30 day component. But uh, in our case, we wanna have it, if that 30 days is within that time frame of when they had the procedure and come to see you. Okay, thank you. And one last question, uh, do there need to be device site photos at each check? Well, the, the initial one, of course, and if you're doing remote monitoring, you don't have a chance to look at it. Um, you wanna have documentation that it was that, that what, it, what the appearance was. Uh, so uh, it's, I think that's important for a hospital to establish the, the, the um, how often a device or a site has to be um, documented. Um, if, there, if, if you do not have a photo, you should be writing in there what the appearance was, of course, uh, but the, the initial photo and any sort of remote um, uh, monitoring, there really should be one at every time you do a remote monitoring check, just because it's really your only chance to see if there's an infection that's ongoing. Because some, as we know, sometimes those infections happen very quickly and pockets are, you know, um, open and, and it happens over a very short period of time. So uh, it's why it's important to uh, document that as routinely as you can. Thank you. That's all the questions that we have. And I will now turn this back over to Kelly. Okay. Thank you, Heidi. And thanks, Frank. Thanks again, everyone.
please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of this live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars, look for the title of this session, Introduction to Device Clinic Accreditation. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event. On the left, select the Evaluations tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through the CE transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intrasocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.